<clears throat> okay. We'll go right ahead. Start with our okay. I'm gonna prayers. <laughs> join in on this other computer. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about the turkey smell. Morning in progress. I'm boiling turkey bones. Don't even notice it. <laughs> it hasn't. It hasn't gotten really to touch yet. Oh, look at you, Molly. So happy. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. Sangye cha dang so ki cha gnam ha jang chu bardu dakni kyap su chi dakni jin so ki pe so nam ki drola penchir sangye du par shu sangye cha dang so ki so gnam ha Jam to Bardu, Dagni, Kiasu, Chi, Dagi, Jinzo, Gipe, Sonam, Ki, Rola, Pinchir, Sange, Drupar, Shu, Sange, Turnam, Soki, Chognam, La, Jam to Bardu, Dagni, Kiasu, Chi, Dagni jinzo gipe sonam gi Rola penchir sangye drupar so Four measurable thoughts. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And we move on to the um, seven limb prayer on the next page. <clears throat> Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time, and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until samsara ends, and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. And I want to say one thing about uh, this limb of rejoicing. The um, our teachers have all always said that rejoicing is the um, easiest way to uh, accumulate uh, positive karma, and there are. And if, if you're not familiar with this, there are two aspects of rejoicing. The first is that we should be rejoicing at our own selves. The fact that we have a human existence with a human brain that can comprehend these amazing teachings of the Dharma, it's as if karmically we hit the jackpot. And so we should just, just rejoice that we that we have this this rebirth that we've got and, and not waste it. I mean, really be thrilled that, that we are on this path, that we're doing this and that we're using this wisely. That's a, a, a great way to accumulate um, uh, positive, positive karma. Because uh, we often get too down on ourselves. And it's just, I thought I would, I would mention that aspect of rejoicing. The other is you rejoice in others' good qualities as well. Okay, now we do the uh, mandala offering. Zaji Perky Jokshi Medito Rangri Adlingshi Nidmide Gyan Party Sangye Nidmide 
Um, okay, and then we have the essence of causation mantra. Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetu tesham tatagato yavada tesham cha yo niroda evan vahi maha shramanana swo. And stanza five from the 18th chapter of Nagarjuna's Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way. By extinguishing actions and afflictions, there is liberation. Actions and afflictions arise from misconception, and misconceptions arise from elaborations. Elaborations will cease through cultivating emptiness. Um, so before we get going, I want to uh, read to you all an email that uh, Geshe Nima sent. Um, I had sent him a, a Oh, just a group of, of the um, recent uh, recordings of the teachings that showed, you know, the topics and all of this really interesting discussions we're having because, because this information is when we take it on board as being personal teachings and make it relevant for our experience in today's world, and, and how, then these teachings really come to life. And so uh, I thought that Geshe Nima would, would enjoy seeing that because he asked that we do this. Right. Um, so I just wanted to read you his response because I found it to be very inspiring and, and it's and it's you know it's really intended for all of us. I'm very happy to hear from you often about your classes and continuous teachings on Bodhisattva's way of life, which is the source of all mind training practices as well as Lam Rin teachings. To be honest, I am very happy that you have entered into such valuable and meaningful and worthwhile paths. Your current Dharma practices and activities related with your Dharma projects are the pure seed of liberation and complete enlightenment. There is no perfect path or reliable way of living other than what you are doing now. The more we familiarize with the bodhisattva's paths, the more we feel content, satisfied, and value our human life. The more we attach to worldly affairs, the more we feel depressed, stressed, and hopeless. The essence of our human life is to enrich or strengthen our mental qualities. These are the inseparable wealth of both our present and infinite future lifetimes. Many people hunger for external wealth and mistakenly perceive them as being real wealth. They become the slave of those things for their whole life and finally turn them into a fundamental source of sufferings and mental pain. It's really sad as a human being for that to happen. <laughs> Thank you very much for your pure, resolute determination and hard work. <laughs> I thought that was just really great to hear that from him. Yeah. You know, was that ridiculous? Getting, yeah, I guess you mean, I mean, basically, he's saying <clears throat> there's no better thing to be doing than what we're doing right now. <laughs> no better thing on the path. So <clears throat> that's very good to hear. Um, all right. This. Um, this is a continuation of the ninth chapter, what we're talking about today. And Shanti Deva gets into uh, the topics of, of interdependence and karma. Um, I thought before we uh, go into that, which I, I doubt we'll get we'll get through all of it, uh, I want to do a um, again a review of what we covered last time because it it connects with what what we're doing here. So in the um, the last session, which was session thirty, we're now we've now this is thirty one Sundays we've been doing this. 
But who's counting? Yeah. Um, ah, that's interesting. Why? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about how long it's been, but yeah, it's it's, it's pretty, you know. We're, hey, um, I'm on you before, this okay. related. I have something to say related to Geshe Nima. Um, but, uh, some of you know this already, but most of you probably don't. Um, he, we recently, um, okay. Over the course of the year, we off and on from various people have received very kind donations, which uh, always go to the monks, either for their airfares, stipends, or other expenses directly away. Or, or nuns. Or nuns. Yeah. I consider women monks. But in any case, with one exception, we have a weekly now. Our MailChimp costs like $23 a month. And uh, we have a wonderful monthly regular automatic donor who made me feel comfortable to sign up. But we have, you know, about $2,000 in the bank. And yeah, I was thinking maybe this year I'll do a financial report just public and, and put a chart out. But that is a, all that aside, what I wanted to tell you was that we just sent um, Geshe Nima um, a $500 donation from the center. So it's a, a conglomeration of all the various gifts that have been given through the center over the last few months. And um, the reason that we had suggested to the board was that we do that is because he's going to be traveling. Now, he has other sources of funds. I know of other people who send him donations independently and so forth. However, just so you know, um, I asked him to please explain what he's doing in Bodh Gaya. Um, and this is what he wrote. <clears throat> Thanks for asking about my upcoming activities in Bodh Gaya. I will leave here around the 10th of December to take part in the International Sangha Forum that is scheduled from the 20th of December to the 22nd of December. His Holiness will inaugurate the conference and attend the last day function. According to the schedule, I am also in the list of speakers. Very humbly hope that according to the schedule, <laughs> not like, and get it. Um, uh, after that, I will be attending His Holiness's teachings and Samdang Rinpoche's teachings on emptiness in the very place of Bodhgaya at the end of December and in early January. Uh, then I will return to Sarah Monastery, which is in Ungad, to go to a conference on the International Sangha, then back to Bodh Gaya to spend all of January and February to complete his retreats on Tara and Manjushri. So we'll be doing that. And this is my brief information about my activities in Bodh Gaya. I myself try to study hard, meditate and practice from the depth of my heart to make certain changes from within. You all, too, please study well and practice as much as you can. Never stop, being, stop your studying. Keep going. And then he has little prayer hands, which you can't probably see. <laughs> That's not very effective, is it? No. <laughs> There's his little prayer hands. Yeah, there they are, all three of them. <laughs> anyway. Although he's, you know, not here often, and who knows when, if ever, he is able to come back. Um, we're really back. fortunate yeah. that he cares about us, and he wants to come back, and he's aware of what we're doing. He's, uh, Christopher and I were talking this morning about the fact that Christopher would never have made the commitment to pursue this um Bodhisattva way of life and commit to the detail if it hadn't been at the recommendation and really request from Geshe Nima. And that illuminated for us when we were just chatting this morning, yet another example about why having 
um, a good relationship with a spiritual uh, mentor is incredibly uh, useful. Um, I, I can't say enough about it, yeah. so I won't say more. <laughs> I wanted to share that information with Geshe Nima. Um, you know, just, yeah. And we've said this before. I know we've talked a lot about our past studies with Geshe Drakpa. The work on the Geshe Drakpa archive, which is on our website, continues. And I just got news that his niece is going to be doing some fresh translation, translations of some of the videos. And I don't know, you know, along with the song, we just have a lot of incredible wealth of dharma that's been poured onto our hearts and minds. And I think all of us increasingly as we catch the gift that's been transferred to us, feel an increased responsibility to keep going, as Geshe Nima said, and, mm -hmm. and to make the most of this life. So, it's a it's a cool thing, and it's sort of like Venerable Robina would say. In 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 other words, we got a free all day pass to Disneyland, and we only have a short amount of time here in Disneyland of Dharma. And so you want to take every ride. So you don't, you're going to take every <laughs> single moment to get the milk the most out of this precious human rebirth. And Perfect. don't miss the light parade at the end. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you for your and patience and all that. Yeah. <laughs> and back to you. And by the way, we're having a bonfire in the New Year's Day. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Which New Year's Day? That or you? This one. Oh, I mean, uh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure. Yeah. yeah, very very yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Probably the other one too. But I don't so know. going back to uh, to uh, uh, the topics uh, in 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 our last session. Uh, Shanti Deva began by um, establishing that subject and object are mutually dependent, that they are codependently exist. Um, this means that conscious awarenesses, which are subjective in nature, arise in dependence upon objective existence. Similarly, objective existence cannot be experienced or observed or identified unless there are subjective consciousnesses to experience, observe, and identify it. The two rely upon one another for their existence as mutually dependent fundamental components of the universe. In other words, the universe exists as a mutually dependent relationship between subjective consciousness and objective existence. That's a very important point that is not often brought up in, in Western philosophy or Western science. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is an essential element of, of uh, what the Buddha says is the nature of existence. And as I said, mentioned last time, um, there's an aspect of this, of real, directly realizing this relationship between subject and object, which enables us to become fully enlightened. So it's an important, it's an important thing. Uh, he then went on to talk about the concept of a creator God. And what he first did is he um, presented and refuted uh, and the argument of atheists um, that all things have no cause, but come into existence merely uh, from their own nature. Obviously things arise due to multiple causes and conditions. And so that, that was refuted by Shantideva. And it's, I think it's easy for, all of us to see that as well. Uh, next, he addressed uh, the pantheistic argument that God is identical to all things in the universe and the cosmos. So if by that, the pantheists mean that living beings and the environment arise from the elements that make up the universe, then Shantideva is in agreement with that. He finds no fault with that. He says what the um, pantheists call God, the Buddhists call um, the elements of nature. And he says it's just merely a difference in terminology. So uh, for those of us who would like to hold on to a concept of God, well, that is one way of looking at it. The, this, 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 this God, what the God is, the creation exists in everything. 
uh, is, is one with it. Um, finally, he debate, de debated the theistic view that God, the creator, is eternal, one, immutable, meaning unchangeable, and worthy of veneration. The God of the theists is involved in the world and in human life, but as a creator is quite distinct from the creation. Uh, but if an unchangeable, <clears throat> permanent God is the creator of all possible effects, then God is responsible for the unsought suffering of creatures. If all effects, including the free will of sentient beings, are wished for by God, then in effect, God wishes suffering for some and happiness for others. This would indicate that creation is not produced by a permanent, unchangeable God, but by impermanent wishes and desires. This makes the belief in an unchangeable, uh, immutable God unfounded. So I would say that uh, Shadideva is always relying on logic and reason, as well as direct and inferential perception in order to come to his conclusions. And um, I find for myself, when I really follow what he's saying, uh, I always tend to agree with it. Mm -hmm. Even though I may not want to, uh, the, the logic itself will go, yeah, I, I guess that's so. So now we move on to um, today's topic. And he starts with, he's talking about the belief in a, a primal substance that the, is the origin of existence. And we here in the West have this a, a, quite a similar belief among a, a large amount of, of people. And that would be it, that there is a, the universe uh, was caused by a, a, this big bang. And what they say the big bang is was this tiny, 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 tiny uh, concentration of every all the everything that would be needed to make up in a universe that just explodes. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know it all it all goes on. So there are there was a group. We talked about this uh, 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 group of Hindu philosophers called the Samkhyas. And we talked about the Samkhyas earlier in uh, chapter nine, when we were talking about the selflessness of persons. And he, he goes back to them. Um, the Samkhyas, here's, here's what the Samkhyas believe. They assert the existence of Atman, which is a true, permanent, um, eternal self, or it would be like what we might call the soul in the West. Um, and it's, it's the essence of each individual. They say that Atman is an individualized example of a universal principle they call purusha. Purusha refers to an, uh, an observing awareness or a witnessing consciousness that they say is permanent and uncaused, present everywhere, it's independent, unattached, and unrelated to anything. So this differs quite a bit with the Buddhist view of the universe, which says, Consciousness, which is witnessing and observing, is consciousness is not independent, but dependently uh, coexists with or co-arises with uh, objective existence. So this is a major difference between Sankhya and uh, Buddhism. They, he, they say, uh, Sankhya say that all the objects that are perceived by the permanent purusha which is this witnessing consciousness, all those arise from this primal substance, this primal substance of the first cause, which forms all the impermanent aspects of reality. Um, so it, similar to us in the West, we say the Big Bang is the first cause. Mm -hmm. There's something about... Hmm. Well, some say that. There's some... Well, some, but in the West... I mean, the Western view... About the Big Bang... Yeah, the, the Western view for a long time... Yeah, the Western view for a long time has you been. You should always be aware that we have a researcher scientist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they, they say that has that not been the view for a long time that they there have. is a first cause. The preferred view by people who can't explain anything any other way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's the preferred. That's so preferred, the preferred view. The preferred view 
for people who can't explain anything any other way. I love it. That yeah. should be now your yeah. qualifying statement. So as we know, <laughs> Buddhism says there's no such thing as first cause. By the way, I'm applying for the presidency at UPenn. I just want to let you know. All right. Bring it on. Because it's open now, I hear. Mm, there you go. I go for it, Brian. Huh? It'll keep you young. <laughs> <laughs> we know he's too. kidding. He's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the that would love to write you recommend that they probably give a shit ton of money. Yeah. 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 Ooh, I shouldn't say yes, that. Yes. Well, well, the problem is, you know, I grew up Jewish and now I'm Buddhist. So, although I say I'm really, you know, go back and say I'm Jewish because that seems to be the popular in thing now, or, you know, what about or, I don't know. You could use both well, depending on where you're The Jew group is actually quite in the Jew group. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you take me with you, Brian? <laughs> what, Brian? I said, can you take me with you, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Brian, yeah. Can be. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Samkhya's call this primal substance, which, you know, forms everything. Uh, all, all effects. They call this prakriti. And you may remember, I remember these that words. Word. I remember okay. that word. Okay, so here's a stanza 126. And this is uh, Shantideva talking. He says, those who hold the permanence of particles, and there he's referring to the Vaibheshika school, he says, were indeed refuted earlier. So Shantideva is saying, we already refuted the idea that there's such a thing as permanent particles when we talked about the Vaibheshika. So he's saying this, this, you know, this primal substance, they're saying is permanent. Well, it doesn't make sense. Because if it's uh, permanent particles, how can it make everything that's impermanent? He says the Samkhya's are the ones who hold that permanent prakriti, that substance, is the cause of the evolving world. So <clears throat> this primal substance, which the Samkhya's say is the cause of the world, this prakriti, is asserted by them to be eternal, one, independent, devoid of consciousness, invisible to ordinary sight and universally creative. So again, they're saying this, they're, they're saying the objective existence and the consciousness that witness it are two independent things here. <clears throat> the nature of this primal matter or prakriti is defined as the balance or equilibrium between three uh, universal qualities or constituents which they call um, sattva, raja, and uh, rajas, and tamas, which means tamas, which roughly those three mean pleasure, pain, and neutrality. To speak in very broad terms, these three uh, constituents of this substance, this primal substance, are pleasure, pain, and neutrality. And they have to, and they normally are in equilibrium. And they say, when the these elements or the qualities of the prakriti fall into a state of um, non-equilibrium, that in other words they're unbalanced, that's when the appearance of the whole universe arises. So there's some kind of movement or unbalance in this in these qualities of pleasure, pain, and neutrality that causes this primal substance to explode into a universe or something like that. Um, the Samkhya's say, all right, so here's what, um, did, 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 did. here's <coughs> stanza, stanza 127, which is just reiterating what I said. Pleasure, pain, neutrality, so-called, are qualities which, when they rest in equilibrium, are returned to prakriti. They go back to this primal substance. The universe arises when this balance is disturbed. The question is really what disturbs it, you know. I, but anyway, <clears throat> Shanti go, David goes on to point out that the uh, Samkhya's lack of logic when they say that the primal substance of the universe is one and independent, and then say that it has three natures is is pretty evident. There can be no such thing as an independent primal cause that it is that is one if it has three different constituent natures that can either be in balance or out of balance. So Shanti is saying this doesn't, this is not logical that you would say this is one and, and independent. 
Likewise, he says the three, these three universal qualities of uh, pleasure, pain, and neutrality themselves can be broken down into three more because you could have, you can have the, okay, okay. Can you I can have, have here we go. No, you can have, the, no, no, I'm trying to say, you can have the um, pain of pleasure, the pain of pain, and the pain of neutrality. Mm -hmm. You could have the pleasure of pleasure, the pleasure of pain, which some people have, have and the pleasure of neutrality. So these can be broken down. Mm -hmm. uh, since they can be out of balance, why can't they, you know, right. do all the kind of things? So Shanti Dave is saying, you know, you can't really say any of this is one and permanent when you're when you're talking this way. So um, is the neutrality of pain and pleasure the balance between pain and pleasure, pleasure or the absence of pain and pleasure? Um it could be that I mean, oh, what neutrality is? Yeah, I mean, have we ever been in a? According to them, who knows? I mean, I, I just speaking personally, there have been there's been instances when things that have given me a lot of pleasure, I can be quite neutral about. Now, it just depends on my state of mind. Is this a question about what that school posits about neutrality? Well, it's both what Shanti Diva and this other school would define as neutrality. Um, another way of saying what would be another way of saying neutrality? Um, 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 there's another word that Shanti did. That they you used. just you know, initially thought when you were describing it, maybe neutrality neutral is the absence of pain or pleasure, which is neither. But then you said you can have the pain of neutrality and the pleasure of neutrality. So I'm a little confused. Yeah, exactly. not, you know, I don't think we have to stick it. talking off the top of the head. So I'm but this is what this is what they said. No, I'm not talking off no, the I top mean, of it. This is what Tati said. The pleasure of neutrality and the pain of neutrality. They, but <laughs> that's what he's saying. That's what yeah, he's saying. Yeah. Okay. okay. We can noodle that out for ourselves that, Sorry, in our own way. <laughs> this is not off the top of my head. <laughs> well, okay. That would be well, awesome. Five days well, again, I, think it's a, yeah. I don't want to belabor, but I think this goes back to this idea of, you know, kind of the origin of everything mm -hmm. and how the origin of everything comes. Because if if there is, if neutrality is nothing, then how do you get something from nothing? There's another way that, there's another word that they use for neutrality as indifference. Okay. All right. Indifference. Okay. So, but what they're saying basically is all of these, all of what are you doing? I was trying to show Brian. Oh, it's okay. They don't need to see. Um, <laughs> what they're pointing out, what Shanti Davis is pointing out, is these qualities are all um, mental qualities. They're conscious qualities, and and because the you know pleasure is can only be experienced by by a consciousness. Pleasure is not experienced by this 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 uh, piece of Kleenex. They, have, they, they cannot experience pleasure, pain, or neutrality. Pleasure, pain, and neutrality are mental concepts. So what it's saying in this Prakriti is that there, which is supposedly um, permanent and, and non-conscious, that it's, they're saying that it has these conscious uh, aspects to it, which Shanti Dev is saying, you're not making sense. This is illogical. Right. Um, so, right. yeah. Uh, la, 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 la. Okay, so at st in stanza 128, Sa Shanti Davis says, three natures in a unity are disallowed, and thus prakriti, the primal substance, is without existence. These three qualities likewise do not exist inherently, for each of them indeed is three. This is what Shanti Davis says. This is what I was just explaining. The Pleasure of pain, the pleasure well, of Well, right, pain. because something that could be painful for you could be pleasurable for someone else. And Absolutely. so it's merely a label of the experience based on the person experience having the experience. Exactly. It's all the same thing. Just one person might be viewing it one way and another person viewing it another. We know this. Yeah. We know this from our And experience. maybe, quite frankly, it's all neutral to begin with. We're the ones applying the pain. And I think we it. could be, you know, yeah. um, uh, uh, what was the word I said? Neutral was another word for it. If we, I think it's possible for us to be indifferent about all of these things, given any given different causes and conditions, you know? Right, right, right. So this is what Shanti Davis is pointing out. Exactly. Um, so in stanza 129, he says, if these three qualities have no existence, no inherent existence, then a thing like sound is very far from plausible. Because what they're saying is all these impermanent 
um, effects are produced by this primal substance. So he said, how could something like a sound um, uh, be plausible? How He says, cloth and other mindless objects cannot be the seats of feelings such as pleasure. So if the three universal qualities cannot actually be established, their manifestation of things such as visual forms and sounds becomes extremely difficult to establish as well. How does pleasure, pain, and neutrality form sound, form um, other kinds of substances, you know? It is also completely incongruous to say that cloth or Kleenex or, um, you know, any other material object, non-conscious material object, can have in its nature the qualities of pleasure, pain, and neutrality because they are material objects and have no mental qualities. Pleasure, pain, and neutrality be, ha, are qualities of mental consciousness, like I said before. And whatever has those in its nature must also be a mental phenomenon. So what he's saying is this primal substance must also have some mental aspect to it, even though the the um, uh, the Sankhya's are saying, no, it's completely non-conscious, has no consciousness at all, and it's completely independent of consciousness. In Sansa 130, the Sankhya's say, but these things, these material things, the cloth, the Kleenex, the whatever, possess the nature, these natures, the nature of their cause. Shantideva says, but have we not investigated things already. For you, the cause is pleasure and the like, and yet from pleasure, cloth has never sprung. A Kleenex has never, uh, the material that makes up a Kleenex has never come out of pleasure. It doesn't come from pleasure. Um, the Samkhya's also undermine their own position by saying that the cause of woolen cloth or Kleenex is pleasure and so forth. And then go on to say that the effect of woolen cloth or Kleenex is pleasure also. In other words, they're saying pleasure is both the cause and the effect of the cloth. The cause and the result of cloth is pleasure. Mm -hmm. This is like saying that a man is both a father and a son to the same person. It doesn't make sense. Okay, so you right. have established, Shanti Deva has established that their whole theory doesn't make sense. It's what he's saying. It doesn't and, make and sense. And how does that help us become better with this? Well, because, I mean, all of us, I'm sure, at one time in our life, perhaps, believed that there was a first cause. And that from this first cause, everything, everything resulted. And what Shanti Deva is saying, there can be a cause, but it can't be the first one. It has to be the effect of another cause, and it goes back and back and back uh, beginninglessly. So to attribute um, a cause to something that actually can't produce that cause doesn't make any sense. So he's looking at this question of first cause from various angles. Mm -hmm. As So should we. And that's why he wrote these verses. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, 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 the task for us in all of this is to um, make this um, meaningful for our own life, present life now, and our position now. And, it, and we can do that. It's just we just have to use our brain a little to do it. Uh, we just have to make the transfer from what, the, what he's saying about this ancient Hindu philosophy of Samkhya's and see how it's, it it's, has similarities to, to thoughts that exist now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I theories mean, that exist now. The reason I'm asking and kind of, because this can kind of get mind numbing. Tell me about it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm thinking about the advice that uh, we were given and what you'll read at the very beginning of this path all, over and over to take all Dharma as personal, personal advice. Personal. And so when you get into this weird, obscure 
uh, debate between philosophies we're not even supposed to believe. You'd wonder what the hell, you know. The, what so I go our task, personal advice. Exactly, that's our task: is to just to make it personal advice that's relevant. It. Analyze it. How does this affect? How does this relate to the way yes, I'm it, thinking? See if it works for Do you. I think at all in these kinds of ways, even even in an unconscious way? Hmm. You know, do I actually think this exists the way it appears to me? Yeah, I do. I have to analyze it the way you know Shanti David talks in order to to move past that. Right. You know? Um. So he's saying. Uh, to say that uh, you know woolen cloth can be caused from pleasure and can result in pleasure is just not even worth serious consideration. <laughs> <laughs> um, stanza 131, he says, pleasure rather is produced from cloth. If this, the cloth, is non-existent, pleasure likewise is non-existent. As for permanence of pleasure and the rest, well, there's a thing that's never been observed. That's, that's Shanti Davis' own words there. Woolen cloth has certainly never been seen to arise from pleasure, pain, or neutrality. And it's true that things like clothes and blankets and garlands of flowers can produce uh, uh, feelings of pleasure in us or, or you know, we can be averted, you know, some people might like the feel of wool on them and they may, I hate this, you know. So it can, it can you know, these things can produce these effects in us. But since the things like cloth have no real independent existence of their own, even on the level of subatomic particles, which we discussed earlier, the feelings of pleasure, pain, and neutrality that arise from them cannot exist separately on their own either. There is no such thing as just self-existent pleasure, self-existent pain. They are a result of something. They're related to something. But the Samkhya say that pleasure, pain, and neutrality constitute the eternal nature of this primal substance. And neutrality must constantly, if that's so, if that's so, then it follows that pleasure, pain, and neutrality must constantly be perceived and cannot be avoided because of their eternal nature. However, we all know from experience that these things are not constantly perceived. We're not constantly perceiving pleasure, pain, or neutrality. We know from our own experience that this is so. So just because the Samkhya's are saying it doesn't make it so. And this is another way we need to take this as a teaching that's relevant to us now. Just because somebody who puts themselves in a position of authority says something is so, it does not mean that it is so. We need to use our own mind, our own logic, our own reasoning, our own evidence, direct evidence and inferential evidence to decide whether this authoritative figure that's saying this and this and this is so, is correct. We are far too lazy about that in, in our current uh, society. We tend to just take on board what you know the authorities are telling us through the media. It's worse through, than that. Know, we what we're doing. <laughs> what I notice myself doing, and I am I pretty sure everyone's doing similar, is we'll scan headlines that. Uh, agree with our current operating bias about what's going on and that's what we think is you know reaffirming our bias and then you know similarly well that's the main thing that's going on right now is we're all looking for the headlines that confirm what we already think yeah. is going on and we never even read into the story and it's kind of amazing what you learn when you read into the whole story i mean we that's another thing we need we need to examine our own biases we need to um because <clears throat> biases are, are, are it's another way of saying prejudice right we need to examine those we need to examine what the basis for those are uh because i don't think uh it's correct to have a bias the, the way the way we experience it i think i think we need to be able to see well what is universally so among all things 
what what is the true nature that you could say of everything? Whether forget the bias, forget the prejudice. What's the true nature here? Why don't you mention uh, we were going to be looking into this uh, logic and debate topic and what Daniel Perdue said in the introduction to his new book about how people that are using the book are finding that it's. Yeah, we will. I don't want to get too off topic there. Um, Sorry. That will be that could be the next thing we go into after we're done with this. Um, the Samkhya's, however, insist that although the three universal natures have a permanent existence, they have a particular feature of being that sometimes manifests and sometimes is hidden. For this reason, they say that it's not inevitable that pleasure, pain, and neutrality would constantly be observed. So they're already you know, sort of making amends to their story, saying, well, pleasure sometimes is hidden, pleasure sometimes is manifest. So let's see why they say that is so. So in stanza 132, um, Shanti Deva says, if pleasure and the others, the rest, are manifestly present, how comes it that they're not perceived? And if you claim they take on subtle form, how is it that they are both gross and subtle. So if the three, these three natures, pleasure, pain, and neutrality, can manifest intermittently, the question then becomes, why? Why? Why are they not constantly perceived if they are eternal? The Sankhya's answer is, if pleasure, pain, and neutrality become more subtle, they exist in a state of non-manifest potentiality and cannot be perceived. Yet, they still pervade the object of perception, the Kleenex. They pervade it and um, dwell constantly in it. But Shanideva asserts that it's a contradiction to say that the primal substance is one and eternal and yet has three different natures with opposing states of grossness and subtlety. And I, I would agree. I'm kind of agreeing with I that. I would agree with that. Yeah. So in stanza 133, he says, Shadi Deva says, if coarseness or grossness is abandoned and subtlety is assumed, subtlety and grossness both lack permanence, therefore. So why not grant that in this way, all things possess the character of transients? transients. He's saying, Shamka, Samkis, why not just say things are impermanent? Because they have a bias. <laughs> um, They're, they really need there to be a permanent something you know, that probably related to the Atman, the eye. Yeah, so yeah, I think, think the Atman, which is said to be permanent. For some reason, uh, we have this, we all kind of have this a sense of, of this permanence, you know, everything around us is permanent, you know, even though we know it's not, even though we see that it changes, we think we ourselves are permanent, even though we're not, obviously. <laughs> um, so, now we go to stanza 134, the Sankhya's are, are answering Shantideva. They say, if the coarser or grosser aspect is none other than the pleasure, it's clear that pleasure itself is impermanent. Uh, I don't know if that's the sum. Maybe I screwed that up. But what, what, whatever, the Samkhya's are saying that whether gross or subtle, the actual nature of pleasure <clears throat> is never lost and therefore its permanent character isn't diminished. So then the question is, is gross pleasure of the same nature as subtle pleasure? If it's different, it would follow that when gross pleasure subsided, pleasure itself would not recede into a state of non-manifest potentiality, but would still be felt and perceived if gross, grossness and subtleness was, they were two different things. Um, they say that whatever becomes 
On the other hand, if gross pleasure is of the same nature as pleasure, then it is simply a degree or an aspect of pleasure, which points out that pleasure itself is impermanent. It has variations in it, mm -hmm. which I would say, this is what we would, this is our experience. Right. So now he's going into the belief in self-production, that something can be produced, like this primal substance can produce something just out of itself without relying on anything else. <clears throat> the Sankhya's are arguing that when the causal constituent or quality of pleasure ceases to manifest, it remains hidden in a potential state within the expanse of the primal substance, Prakriti. When it later reappears, it's merely the manifestation of what was already there all along. The Samkhya say that if the three constituents or qualities of the primal su substance didn't already exist, they would not be able to come into being. They say that whatever becomes manifest must have existed un uh, until that moment, according to its own nature, within the sphere of this primal substance. This assertion by the Samkhya's amounts to saying that cause and effect coexist at the same time. So in stanza uh, 134, Shanti Deva says, if you claim that what does not exist in any sense because it has no being cannot manifest, although you have denied the birth of things mm -hmm. that did not previously exist, it's this that you're now, now saying. It's hard to understand what this is meaning. But if results exist within their cause, if <laughs> This is funny that he says it. If results actually exist within their cause, um, then those who eat their food are consuming their own excrement. <laughs> That's true. Because food is the cause of shit. <laughs> so if, if the cause exists at within. the same time, <laughs> already exists within the food at the same time that when you're eating food, you're eating shit, is what Shanti Dev is saying. <laughs> um, so he's saying the Samkhya's are weakening their argument when they talk this way. Although they don't actually mean to say that the manifestation of an effect is absent at the time of its cause and that it arises anew, and in reality, things are born new. This is, in fact, what they that what amounts to what they just said. They claim that nothing is born anew, but in reality, it is. We can see clearly a manifest sprout does not exist at the time of its cause. It only exists as a potentiality in the seed, and it is produced at a later time when it meets the additional causes and conditions that enable that sprout to form. Mm -hmm. Now, on a personal on a personal level of our own consciousness, we can say that our Buddha nature, Buddha nature exists as a potentiality within uh, every conscious being. Mm -hmm. However, that does not mean that the Buddha nature is, our, we're already Buddhists. I mean, there are many, there are many people who have asked this. Well, if we have Buddha nature, that must mean that we're already we're already Buddhists, right? When somehow we're just experiencing this to you know enhance our sense of Buddhahood. That's not that's not what Shanti Dev is saying. He's saying this, for instance, in our own personal case, Buddha nature exists as a potentiality. However, unless that potentiality that we all have meets with the causes and conditions that will enable that potentiality to grow and develop and ultimately take birth as Buddhahood eventually, then the Buddhahood will not arise. You know, yeah, we're, 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 we're still excrement that needs to turn into food. <laughs> we are still excrement that needs to be, you know, turned into something beautiful. Pervert. <laughs> you need to retrace the alimentary canal. Yeah. Back to so, uh, <laughs> So, so he basically is saying what the Samkhya's are saying just doesn't hold. It doesn't hold. You can't yeah. say that all of these, you know, uh, effects exist at one with a cause. They don't. From our experience, we know we're not enlightened. Right. Okay. You know? Okay. So those Samkhya's, yeah. they're really into permanence, and Shanti Deva really wants to look at it from every angle. But, but just look around the world. How, how, how much of how that is going go, on? That, is going, that belief in permanence. Yeah. 
you know, we can see it, but still, it's still, it was happening in the 8th century, it's happening now, it's still going on. Just different, different set of circumstances, different set of theories, you know, um, different levels of technology. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that does not exist at the time of its cause and then comes into existence later is a perfect example of a newly born phenomenon. The Samkhya's position is self-contradictory and it lacks clear reasoning. If the Samkhya's believe that a sprout can exist at the time of the seed, do they also believe that excrement exists at the time of its cause, the food? And if so, then when they eat food, they're eating their own shit. <laughs> this is what Chandigheta says. So then he goes on. He, in stanza 136, Chandigheta says, and likewise, with the money that the Samkhya's would spend on clothing, why don't they just buy the cotton grains to wear, you know? <laughs> but the Samkhya's say, but the world is ignorant and blind, for this is, this is only taught by those who know the truth. Yeah. I must have chicken shit on the bottom of my foot. Yes, look at that. <laughs> Excrement for one, food for another. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Shani Davis says, with the money the Samkhya's use to buy their fine cotton clothing, why don't they just buy the cotton seeds, which the fabric comes from, and cover their bodies with those instead? At least that might be a way to prove their theory. <laughs> the Samkhya's insist, however, that the effect coexists in the cause, but ordinary worldly people don't see that because their eyes are blinded by the darkness of ignorance. <sighs> But Shani Davis says in stanza 137, this knowledge must be present in the worldly too. And if they have it, why don't they see it? If now you say that what the worldly see has no validity, this means that what they clearly see is false. Shani Deva is saying that ordinary worldly people do have this knowledge because the Samkhya's have taught it to them. The Samkhya's teach this at the, in the 8th century. They were teaching this to ordinary worldly people. So why don't the worldly people that they teach come to understand and see that effects already exist in their cause? <clears throat> if the Samkhya's say that the perceptions of these worldly people have no validity, this means that they are saying that what these people clearly can see with their own eyes is false. But in fact, what they see with their own eyes is actually correct. And it's unmistaken in, with regard to the object that they're seeing. For the Samkhya's to say that effects are present in their causes because they manifest at a later time is just meaningless. Mm -hmm. So now we're getting into the actual, Samkhya's actual, uh, uh, Dev's actual ref refutation of self-production. And in 138, the Samkhya's say, if there is no validity in valid knowledge, is not all that it assesses false, and therefore it becomes untenable to meditate on voidness, ultimate reality. This section gets um, tricky to, uh, to, uh, to understand because he's really uh, talking about emptiness now. <clears throat> The Samkhya's are now testing the Mandamikas with the following, with this question. Since, according to you, Prasangika Mandamikas, valid cognition is not truly existent, must it not then be false? Therefore, isn't any object that is ascertained by such a cognition also false? If this is the case, isn't emptiness, the emptiness you speak of, in fact false, because the valid cognition that realizes it is false? If such mm -hmm. false emptiness is meditated upon, doesn't it become incapable of being maintained? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in stanza 139, Shanti Davis says, if there is no object for analysis, no object of observation, no object to analyze. There can be no grasping of its non-existence. If you don't know what your object 
that you're analyzing is. How can you actually assess or, or uh, apprehend that it doesn't have any inherent existence? You have to understand what, what the object that you're refuting, that you're negating, is what he's saying. Um, so he says deceptive objects of whatever kind will also have a non-existence equally deceptive. <clears throat> He, Shanti Dave is saying that you have to realize what the prasangikas mean by non-true existence. And you have to cor correctly identify the true existence that they're saying is being negated. So in relation to emptiness, unless we can um, identify the object that is to be negated, we will not have a valid apprehension of its non-existence. <clears throat> so the object that <clears throat> is negated, when we're talking about emptiness, we're talking about the prasangika view, the object that is negated is this so-called true existence. So what that means is, what as we've talked before, what true existence means is inherently independent existence, something that exists all unto itself independently. That's what President Giga is saying when they're saying true existence. And that is the object that is to be identified and negated, that anything can exist, can have this self, independent self-existence. <clears throat> the apprehension by a valid mind of that object's non-existence is the apprehension of emptiness, which means the emptiness of inherently independent self-existence. Emptiness means complete lack. There is a complete lack of any kind of independent self-existence in any object. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about the object of negation is this independent self-existence and the, um, the valid... Um, the valid apprehension of that is to apprehend the emptiness of that object, the emptiness of that object having any kind of independent self-existence. We have to actually apprehend that. We have to realize that. We have to have, to have a direct perception of that. Chris, th yeah. th just from a, like a practical standpoint, I know this is something, and, and I still struggle with it, but like a lot of teachers have really emphasize the importance on some of the retreats I've been on where they're like, you really have to spend time in the, what is it? They call it the gakja, the, 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 the thing to be refuted and yeah. that, that inherent thing. And it's like, that's a really key step of like, you got to really understand what it is that, and and it's hard it's really hard for some reason and um so so it's interesting like the correctly ident this whole idea of like correctly identifying the object to be negated they're like if you don't do that first you're gonna miss some really important thing here and it seems like I don't know, just from a pl practical standpoint, like I still work on that a lot in trying to figure out, well, what what exactly am I negating? You know, um, it's easy to just say, oh, independent, inherent, but like to internalize that, or really know what that means is tough. Yeah, um, I guess yeah. you probably used to say the same thing. Unless you can yeah. identify the object of negation, you will never have a direct experience of emptiness and what that means. So <clears throat> I agree with you. I think we have to constantly be analyzing. So it's anal you take any object and you analyze it. Does this object actually exist the way it appears to me to exist? Sort of like this independently existing thing. And so you have to, no matter where you turn and look, you have to, you have to analyze. So when to, in order to identify the object of negation, we have to analyze that object. We have to analyze that object thoroughly, um, not only from its objective existence, but the subjective objective relationship that's going on between our own conscious awareness and, and that object, because that object, for instance, glasses, 
these only exist as glasses due to a cognitive designation. The consciousness is designating this thing as being glasses. The glasses within themselves are not saying, oh, I'm a pair of glasses, look at me. Right. There's no consciousness whatsoever in these glasses. So we have to understand that the when we're, we're identifying this object of negation, it includes an aspect of how we, our own consciousness, is labeling that, you know. Uh, so it's it's huge. It's a really big. It's a big aspect. It's the it's the. I guess it's the fundamental step in having a realization of emptiness. You cannot go. Yeah. You get that. You can't go you can't any further. There. Yeah. And 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 I I find myself. Um, it's, I don't want to say lying to myself, but like, it's very easy to say. Oh yeah, no, I understand that that's impermanent and that's the, but that's not enough. <laughs> like it's, do yeah. you know what I mean? I don't yes. know what I'm trying. like. There's a depth to that realization of what you just said. The subjective net, like part of that subjective side of it is to really be brutally honest that like, yeah, there is a part of me that thinks this is really going to last, that it really exists out there, that it really, and right. Uh, and until that really sinks in, like, there's just no, yeah, and it's tough. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm. No, no, no. I, I think, you know, it's to me, I mean, to me, from personally, it's as if my habit of clinging to things as if they, they really are there is so strong that it's the, the words alone will not work for me. I can't just say, oh, yeah, I understand that it's, you know, this these glasses are made from all these different substances and it was formed by somebody who had this idea. All of that is not actually giving me a direct experience that this thing doesn't have any inherent existence. Been, I've only had brief flashes. I remember when I was studying this stuff at the computer, you know, uh, last week i i would i would study this and then i would just hold this cup you know and i would begin to look at it and try and look at it understanding all the words that have been had been said and try and see it as if like how does how did, how would this actually exist if i could take away my conceptual designation of that this is a um i don't know i call it an adult sippy cup you know a thermos cup how <laughs> How would how does this actually exist if I could just remove that subjective uh, view of it and it starts to get kind of freaky? All of a sudden you're going, what the, what am I holding? What what and what is this that's holding it? I mean, it, it goes it gets kind of gets weird and trippy and I think maybe those are little little tastes of where you could go with this, you know. But it it go, comes down to experience. First of all, you have to logically analyze and so you have to use your words you have to use um concepts uh, well i mean conceptual thought is extremely important without conceptual thought we will never achieve enlightenment conceptual it has to start with conceptual thought so you use your conceptual thought to kind of analyze it but then once you kind of go uh -huh, I, I'm, I totally understand my conceptual thoughts here you sort of let go of them and then you try to experience what your conceptual thoughts have been telling you and then it can get then you start to get into the level of direct perception i may have already <clears throat> referenced this experience but recently i was looking at one of these uh images that is uh, made up of all these colors and shapes that if your uh, usual analytical mind is operating you and your eyes are all your normal way of looking at it you don't see that there's a picture that emerges, a 3D picture that emerges from it. Um, and I was wondering if our lead, and you know, so I, you know, I, I knew that the picture was there. Someone had told me what the picture was and I just kept staring at it and then something happened and then boom, suddenly I could see the picture. And I've been wondering if that is the similar experience that when you go from the analytical inferential knowledge, say, like you're saying, Brian, of selflessness, and then all of a sudden, boom, one day it just pops yeah. out at you. This is when a good you're not example. even trying, you know, you just go, okay, I'm just going to let it sit there and I'm going to let it 
I what Kavita know. just mentioned is a really good example because I was there too. It was a it's a picture that my brother and his wife have on their wall. Um, and all it looks like, all it looks like is just a bunch of random colored dots all over the place, all these colored dots. And they, t they told us, if you look at this the right way, you're going to see a three-dimensional, um, you're going to see what they, they're, they're Christians. So you say, you're going to see a three-dimensional image of Christ on the cross. And you're, and so I would look at this thing and going, I only see dots. I don't know what you're talking about. And she says, well, you just have to let go. <laughs> you know. So I actually took the thing off the wall and I'm staring at all of these dots and I just sort of let go of my focus. And this is an interesting thing. And this may be something about let going of our conceptual mind when we're trying to come to a realization of, of emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. I let go of my focus and all of a sudden there was this three-dimensional picture and Christ was on the cross there and it's like, oh, I can look all around. And it was frightening. It was, it took, it took me by surprise and it was a little scary because all of a sudden there was this thing that I hadn't seen before that was there all the time. And I think Kavita mentioning that is a, it's a good um, analogy, perhaps, mm -hmm. for what, what it's like when we finally, after we've analyzed the thing and, you know, go, I mean, all I'm seeing is a cup, but we let go, we let go of the focus of our conceptual mind and just experience directly what is there. And, and they say, when it first happens, it is frightening. It can frighten you, a, a realization of emptiness. So, and, and that was the experience I had when I held this thing of dots and all of a sudden there was this 3D world in there, you know? It was kind of, it was weird and crazy and amazing. So <clears throat> that's it, but you know, it's a, it's a good point you make, Brian. It's a, it's a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, so... We need to analyze. We need to use a conceptual yeah, mind. I mean, as, as tedious as the Shanti Davis stuff is in Chapter 9, one thing that I have got, again, and this is why taking it as personal advice, is that someday I'll be on a meditation cushion trying to realize emptiness. Someday in, in some future life, and um, it will have been helpful to, ex you know, something will come up, and I'll think I get it, and you know, I just imagine that somehow these various refutations will come into play on um, in the exercise of yeah. trying to realize selflessness or emptiness or another something. thing. Another thing we should never, never, ever, ever forget is that this wisdom wing exists in conjunction with this compassion wing. So the whole point, the whole point of having a direct realization of emptiness is to be able to understand that suffering can be removed. There's a way to remove it. We have to realize what the nature of things actually are, and then we will be able to remove the suffering for ourselves and then help others to do the same for themselves. Um, so it's it's not as if it's just like, oh, yeah, I just want an experience of emptiness. No, there's a reason. The reason has to do with removing suffering and achieving happiness. That's the reason. So, um, and it's not just for ourselves, but for everybody. So we we should never lose sight of that, you know, because we could you could get too, you could get just too focused on the wisdom side, too intense on, you know, right. oh, I got the realization of emptiness and get all noodly in your head. But we should never forget what the reason is, right. you know, the reason is to be a benefit, you know, to help remove suffering. This is where I found it in the last year or so, I found it in a new way. I have found it helpful to encounter problem people in my life and feel the frustration that I can't really effectively help them no matter what I do. It doesn't really help. So I found it weirdly motivating with regard to Bodhicitta. It's like, uh, you know, I can say all of the right things of this person, and I, but I'm, I wish I could actually do something that would actually help them change. Yeah, yeah, and wow, wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah, you know, so it has been a helpful motivation, yeah. knowing troubled people. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think problem people in your life can help. We all can relate to this. You know, we we there we all have people close to us in our lives that we would love to be able to help, and. 
And no matter what we do, what we try, it doesn't it doesn't seem to work. And if it wouldn't it be wonderful, you know, if we had an omniscient mind that could completely size up what's going on in that person's head and what would be the exact right thing to say or do that would trigger a transformation in them that would send them down a path of healing and happiness, you know, wouldn't that be great? And so this is the reason for doing this. <laughs> Again, the other end, Sunday being, has to want to of course. be healed. Number one. Number two, their karma may dictate that they have to have a certain experience. They, yeah, what they are going through independent of your great wishes and your mm -hmm. cheated wishes. So, and you have to be careful because, you know, if you get to a position where, well, you know, as a Bodhicitta or as a Buddha, I ought to be able to say the exact right thing. The Buddha may also know, look, I'm here to help if you want my help, but I'm also here to know that I can't sometimes help you in this current situation, this current time, this current activity. And right. so I, even as a Buddha, I may not necessarily be able to accomplish nirvana for, for everyone. Obviously, Buddha can't accomplish nirvana for anyone without them participating. Yeah, we have exactly. to do it. Otherwise, we'd all see you. What do you mean by help? You know? Right, because a slap in the face could be helpful just as much as, you know, caring someone and help, you know, nurturing them. Yes. Up. You know, it just depends on, and that's where it comes in, where Buddha is all-knowing and omniscient and can see exactly what is needed for any individual being to be of help right. are we like you know yeah they say the buddha can see their entire karma right. they can let's see say, it i mean let's say so they know we know right. we know a guy who um is waiting for a legal proceeding he can't get a job he's a certified radio radiology technician 50 years old really nice guy blah 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 but he's in limbo he can't work he can't he's got lots of emotional baggage and and, you know, there's nothing I can say or do, you know, there's really nothing I can say or do. You can already see, and, and it kind of comes down to what you were saying, Brian, almost in a more direct way. It's like, until he realizes that he's the only one that can help himself, that right. this is one of the things about yeah. this that it's hard to... Yeah, we're all looking like for a savior. Thing, the, when we take refuge, what do they always say? The real refuge is the Dharma. Right. And what do we, you know, when you analyze, well, what does that mean? That means the real refuge is wanting to align your thinking and your behavior with reality. The real refuge would be one's own Dharma realizations. So yeah. then you go, well, what would it look like to actually be able to help all sentient beings? Well, I guess, like we see Buddha, if Buddha is enlightened, how is Buddha helping me? He's just throwing the Dharma in front of me and hopefully I'll stumble on it and notice it, you know. I don't know. I mean, I'm wondering what helping me you know, is now. Right? Well, intent, intent is important. Huge. You have to have proper intent and then Buddha and the Dharma help you and the wisdom we help you have proper intent mm -hmm. about every act that I'm going to take, every thought, every time you do something with your body, change your mind. So, I always do it with a positive intent. And but again, as long as you're doing it with a positive intent, you're following the, the teachings or the logic of the of the philosophy, even though the effect may not be the effect you are attached to or you desire as the as the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so because if you are able to, and I hate to say it this way, but if you're able to be all knowing, be all seeing, and do everything you're supposed to do the right way all the time. That's almost like being, you know, an all powerful being that we say doesn't really exist in Buddhism. Well, Buddha is that. Yeah, but the, but the Buddha but actually doesn't have, it's not all powerful because if the Buddha was, then why would the Buddha have made everybody in life? Exactly. So obviously it has to happen one consciousness at a time. <laughs> and, and it has to be done. Uh, by each one of us on a personal level, the 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 uh, you know our teachers and uh, uh, enlightened beings and Buddhists can show us the way and help us and point us in a direction. And some of our teachers help in different ways. Some are very kind and they're patient and they you know nurture you. Other teachers are not kind 
They're not patient. They smack you in the butt. You know, <laughs> get off your ass. <laughs> you know? The same teacher can be one to one person and another. Person. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it depends on they, they kind of size you up and see your temperament and what mm -hmm. will you know what's going to you know what is actually going to get you off your butt. What's going to work for you? Mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that? You know, with everybody we come into contact with, including our pets. You know. Mm -hmm. It would be great. <laughs> so that's that's you know that's the purpose of this. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> that's fine. I don't care how long it takes. You know, I I like the discussions. <laughs> um. It is our. Okay. When the processing geek is say. <clears throat> that all phenomena are not truly existent and are falsely existent. They are not saying that they are utterly untrue and false, but rather that they are empty or devoid of a deceptive and falsely imagined true existence that we have mistakenly attributed to those things, those phenomena. It's our clinging are clinging to the deceptive and falsely imagined independent existence of phenomena, a habit that we have acquired from beginningless time, according to the Buddha, that is at the present moment binding us to samsara and the suffering of cyclic existence. The antidote to this, the antidote to this is quite simply to begin to develop the habit of considering all phenomena to be without any inherently independent existence. So going back to uh, what, what you and I were talking about, Brian, the beginning, what we have to do at the very beginning is just start having a habit of conceptually considering <laughs> that uh, everything I see does not exist independently and it has it only has the meaning I'm giving to it. It has no meaning. This this has no meaning from its own side. This box of Kleenex doesn't know that it's a box of Kleenex. It doesn't even know what it's for. It's just a box of Kleenex. So we're the ones who are giving all of these things the meaning. And the more we can habituate ourselves to looking at things, hearing things, feeling things, with that point of view, that's that's the start. That's where we start. That's the beginning of the antidote to the suffering of samsara and being stuck in it with everybody else stuck in it. Um, and he's saying, Sardi Davis saying, emptiness itself. Um, we can't. We should not reify emptiness itself. Emptiness itself is a dependent rising. The emptiness. The emptiness of this. These sheets of paper depends on the sheets of paper. If there is no object right. of, of negation, then there is there's no uh, realization of the emptiness of that object. So emptiness itself is a dependently arising thing as well. And that's that's an interesting concept to get the conceptual mind around. Mm -hmm. So, I'll go back to something Kavita said earlier. So take the paper there, for example. Yeah. You know, the paper itself is empty of inherent existence, even though conventionally it looks like it mm -hmm. exists independently. Yeah. So I think again, sometimes we get mere mired in kind of these very substantial details about this, but you always see you always need to go back and continue to try to relate these understandings, these statements, these ideas, this knowledge to how it helps you become, you know, more caring, sentient being at the end of the day. So Absolutely. my question is, how is the paper being empty of inherent existence make me a better? sentient being well <clears throat> this is just you know it, it's example know, right? but, that, but i'm i'm ready no. to a specific question take it for example if we said um that you know my 
brand new Lexus that I love. And I just love it is empty of inherent existence. And I'm the one who's giving it all the meaning that it has for me. However, I would get really, 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 really upset if somebody smashed in the headlights and ran their keys across the hood and the sides and just made a mess of it. The reason I would get upset, the reason I would get upset is that I am attached to that Lexus being inherently existent. If I was able to say that Lexus only has the meaning I give to it, it doesn't actually exist inherently as anything. Can I put it another way? I have the uh, expectation that that Lexus will go on existing in the perfect condition Mm -hmm. that I prefer. We have the expectation that our body will go on existing. Why do we get upset? Because we are not, we are, we are grasping onto the inherent existence of the, of the body. Right. So we're we're attached to the beautiful paint job on our Lexus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We expect it to always be that way. And we seem incensed and shocked that anything should happen to <laughs> make it not the beautiful. Right. And if somebody was the cause of that, then anger arises in us and we are we we develop afflictive emotions based on it. Now, of course, this is probably not going to happen with the paper. Probably. But, but you never know. Just, Somebody could be really attached to their box of Kleenex and get all bent out of shape if it fell on the I mean, wall. ultimately, the paper is just an example yeah. for you to then learn and get your mind around the fact of certain existences so that you can then apply it in other ways, in a compassionate way. When you're the paper is an example of the passion. Is that right? Well, actually, there's a minor attachment to the paper, but I am attached to the paper because if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to print out what was on the computer, and it would be very difficult for me to uh, I'm know, gonna, do this. No, yeah. your attachment is that paper, your attachment to paper is that paper exists as a means, reliable, unchanging phenomenon that you can print on. Right. right. Same That's with the, the attachment. Same, same with the attachment to the expectation, printer. And I guarantee you, your expectation is that that's reliable paper, printer paper, that is going to behave in the way that you expect it to. And mm-hmm. the, the attachment is not is a little bit more, it's not a minor attachment. That's as big an attachment. It's the same attachment, but it seems minor in our the way we talk about it, but it's the same phenomenon. You expect that paper to be reliable, and I I know you. And if that paper didn't behave well, and the printer got jammed, toner up. didn't <laughs> go on it correctly, you go, oh shit. Yeah, I would go. <laughs> no, that's absolutely true, and I have gone, oh shit. However, that is minor in compared to wanting to go out and harm someone or kill them because they. No, I mean, you know, I think you want to be careful property. about minor and major yeah. attachment. Is attachment is attachment in the sense. That we're projecting onto things an assumption that they're going to exist the way we want them to. Exist. Right, and that, and and so yeah, I agree with you. So in that sense, the hell realm and the god realm are equal in terms of their sense of attachment. It's just the suffering is at different levels because of because of the intensity. Mm-hmm. I would say the intensity and the the harm and the and the. Um, the harm. Well, that's, that's, that's a the lack of that's a lot of example because we all yeah. have different concepts right. of what you're even talking about right now. We say well, according to Buddhism. Yeah, according to Buddhism, various realms. Yeah, can can I make a comment about uh, John's comment in the chat? Um, yes, please. He, uh, he basically, is the argument against any external true objects or any causally independent external object, but allowing dependent external ones? I'll just one of the which is a really good question um and without going too deep into uh mind only school versus you know et cetera et cetera but i had a teacher that his example uh use it like yours with paper was he'd hold up a pen and 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 he'd always say you know okay we see this as a pen you know, a dog, our consciousness sees it as a pen. It projects this self-existent penness to it. And he's like, a dog's going to walk in the room, sees a chew toy. 
Like it's just so, yeah. you know, and it doesn't have all that projections. OK, so the consciousness is what's projecting that on. Now, is there really any true external object out there is what they would he, people would say would always ask, you know, and and to I think to John, to your question about um, I think it's it's the latter. It's the in de, uh, interdependent, causally dependent, because he's like, well, if you believe there's no object out here, you're welcome to come up here and I'll draw a little mustache on you because it, it will work. <laughs> right. That was kind of his way of saying, yeah, there is an object out here. Um, it's but it exists in a way completely different than we think it exists. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, yeah, I mean, G Geshe Dropper used to say a similar thing. He says, if you think you know this body is non-existent, you know, try sticking a pin in it and then see what you think, you know, because you know you're going to feel it. Right. So it's a tricky question, but it's the right. it's as if um. The blind, maybe the blind. No, it's, it's as if when, I mean, we discussed this when we talked a little bit about um, um, the Chitta Matra, the mind only view, and how things are projections of the mind. But um, all of our senses are, are taking in are, and are translating various frequencies and uh, waveforms into the objects of those senses. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we have, you know, touch feeling sense, we have eye sense, ear sense. So all of these things play into what appears to be to us an object that is out there. But for another, just as you pointed out with a dog, say, say it's another completely different kind of being, completely different kind of being. Right. They're going to be, they're going to be translating uh, the waveforms and particles in, in different ways that are not like us. Mm -hmm. They'll be seeing something different um, and experiencing a different thing than we are. Uh, so it is a good question that John is raising, and basically, they everything is dependent. They are dependent arising, as well as our our um, our emotional uh, relationship with them. For the for instance, what Kabita was saying, there is actually no small attachment and no big attachment. It's just levels of of this emotional relationship that we have with something, and so. <sighs> It's yeah. complex. I, I, I'm, I know we're over time, but I feel compelled to um, <laughs> do a little thingy. Okay, this little, this is a little Dharma wheel gift object. So when I was gazing at it, and you can do this with any object, and you just start to go deeper and deeper into layers of analysis. So First thing is, um, you know, you start to think, okay, the material, you can see all the various materials, the metal and the paint and so forth. And all those things were independently, it started, started their appearing existence independently from one another by people for example, there was some guy who thought it would be neat to create a paint called green. And somebody else thought it would be neat to create a fake gold metal. And somebody else thought it would be neat to express Buddhism in this Dharma wheel shape. And, you know, all these layers of intention. So one of the ways you can flip yourself out is to realize that in terms of the material world and the man-made things, that what you're viewing is uh, space particles that have succumbed to manipulation by many, many people's intention to manifest a thing. And in this case, it's a Dharma wheel. You can do the same kind of crazy analysis with a mug or a cup or a, a Lexus. But, and... So at least in terms of the material world, you can kind of start to flip yourself out about how intention, as Brian and, and both Brian's have mentioned, that intention is everything. And then, you know... I and mean, you don't even need drugs to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, I don't know you how to do that. I don't know how to apply that to COVID or me. Yeah. Exactly, but... 
you know, same theory applies. Somewhere there's this consciousness that is taking particles, space particles, and conglomerating them up and making this person called a woman who flails her arms around and thinks and says stuff. And, you know, it's constant, it's constant evolution of attention. Right. Yeah. In other words, everything is dependently arising. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing exists independently. Um, and it's dependent on arising in many, many ways. It's arising independent on attention. It's arising independent on cognitive um, um, labeling. It's arising in dependence upon particles, you know, coming together. So there are levels and levels and levels of dependent arising. Um, you look around and you're going to see intention everywhere. Intention exists in every single object that we're looking if at. If nothing else, that would be a trippy exercise today. Just there is intention. <laughs> I'm noticing that a whole bunch of people had an intention. There is it. conscious Someone intention. Someone thought that fabric would be cool. Someone thought this type of couch leg would be nice and someone right. you know and then someone thought uh, well, let's put that all together and then someone yeah you know, i mean it just goes on and on anyway blah, yeah blah. yeah it is yeah. <laughs> so, uh i know we're, we're, i just want to get a little yeah. i wanted to talk uh, about this last thing this last that. thing john is asking is there a good source for this view yes in the if you look into the schools of buddhist philosophy it would be called the middle way consequence school or the Majjhimika Prasangika, and I'll paste, put that in the chat. I'll write it. It's a, uh, so you'd go to uh, a book, you could go through cutting through appearances to find middle way consequence also called um, Madhyamika, oops, Madhyamika Prasangika. And incidentally, that is the, that is the uh, view of how things exist that is posited by the holders in our, in our school, lineage school of Tibetan Buddhism, his Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, that? and so forth. Yeah, that's the view. That's the view we're actually discussing here. That that Prasangika, uh, that Shanti Deva is talking. Yeah. About. By the way, yeah. So Shanti mm -hmm. Deva's. Um, what I would say to you, John, is that um, that book cutting through appearances is not going to make it any easier. Having said that, Alexander Berenson. Alexander Berenson is not going to make it easier. Well, you know. We just have to. We just have to plod through it. We have to do the work. There is no easy. There is no easy emptiness, you know, one, two, it's three made easy. easy. No. Um, emptiness for dummies. There's for dummies, there isn't one. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I want to get through this just last yeah. bit and then it's we'll be set. Day. Okay. Um, Shani David, sort of this last stanza, he talks about um, when we have a, when somebody has a dream of a, their child that has died, um, the state of mind in the dream, the thought that the child has died replaces that the thought that the child was alive. Both of those thoughts in the dream are equally deceptive because they are occurring in a dream. Yet the thought that the child has died has the ability to overcome the thought that the child was alive. So then take that analogy of a dream and, and think of this samsaric existence that we're in. Is dream-like in, in, in its essence? Um, because it is just a dependent arising of many, many elements coming together. In a similar way to the dream, both the realization of emptiness and the conception that grasps at the inherently independent existence of phenomena are equally deceptive in that they are, that they each have no inherent independent self-existence. Emptiness has no inherent independent self-existence and the grasping at inherent self-existence, grasping at phenomena has no independent self-existence. That phenomena does not. <clears throat> but the realization of emptiness is still able to overcome the grasping at inherent existence within this, this dream. And therefore, 
that the realization of emptiness that can overcome the grasping of inherent existence is the thing, as I said before, that is going to lead us out of suffering, lead us out of this samsaric state of mind, you might say, state of mind and um, form. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the final thing is here, it's, it's important to recognize the distinction between phenomena being false and phenomena being falsely existent. These are two different right. distinctions that are being made. All phenomena are falsely existent because they are empty of inherently independent self-existence. Even the ultimate truth of emptiness is empty of inherently independent existence and is therefore said to be falsely existent. Only conventional truths are said to be false phenomena. Mm -hmm. Here the term false needs to be understood as meaning that the phenomenon's mode of appearance and the phenomenon's mode of existence are not the same. The mode of the appearance of this thing and the mode of existence, how this actually exists, are not the same. Mm -hmm. In, um, a, ph a conventional phenomenon is false because although it appears to be inherently independent, in fact, this is a false mode of appearance. An ultimate truth, for example, an emptiness, is not a false phenomenon because when it appears to perception, its mode of appearance corresponds to its mode of existence, which is why when one has a direct realization of the emptiness of this thing, it can seem frightening. Mm -hmm. Like when we were talking about the picture of dots all of a sudden oh. appearing as a three three D you know form that it was you know that that existed within it, it was sort of frightening uh, because it's not what we expect, you know. And the 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 the, the, the uh, the direct reality, the direct reality, uh, the perception of that direct reality is is stark and um, mm, uh, would almost like take your breath away. So, so I just wanted to get that idea between falsely existent and false, and to remember that it's only conventional phenomena are false because their mode of appearance and the, their mode of actual existence don't are, are different. They 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 seem different to us. Okay, <laughs> that that covers it for the day. Wow, a um, lot. It is a lot. It's, it's it's emptiness is John. Emptiness is not an easy thing, <laughs> and it it's um I don't know. I've been studying this for eighteen years, and it's still it's the doors are opening. You know the the curtains are you know still coming apart here. <clears throat> it's it is. I feel it won't probably not be in this lifetime. That I have a direct relationship, closer. but closer, closer, you know. You get and, ready for the next one, and, you know, and then you'll be ready. Yeah, and I and always to remember to keep that to keep the wisdom wing in balance with the compassion wing. Keep the, the idea of loving kindness and compassion and the wish to be of benefit in balance with why we're studying all this wisdom stuff. That's so you know. And the last stanza you were reading, that was what, 140? That The last stanza I read was... Is um, that about 140? 140, yes, it's 140, okay. yeah. Okay. We show any more, you know, comments here? <laughs> Our brains are run. I see, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's do the um, dedication prayers. <sighs> Let's say them again in English because it's. I, I think it's important we hammer this in. So these these um, starting at Jiangshu. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So that is the compassion when we're talking about this idea of bodhicitta, wanting to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That saying, may that grow, may that not decline. Then we go to the next one. May the view of emptiness not yet born arise and grow. 
may that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So with these prayers, they're saying, keep this in balance, keep this wisdom wing and the compassion wing constantly growing, constantly, you know, you know, constantly getting more and more uh, strong in our in our in our mental continuum in our heart. <laughs> and then the um, final dedication, again in English, in all my lives, may I not be separated from true lamas and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma. Fully perfecting the virtues of levels and paths, may I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara. And when you think when you think about it, there is no way that we could ever have had received any of this knowledge, been able to get on this path without the help of teachers who came before us, and then the whole lineage of those teachers who came before them. And we are connected I to that the lineage. You said, There's no better way. Yeah, and Geshe Nima, he's saying there's just no better thing we could be doing now than than this. No better thing. To, to be using our life for this is the best thing that we could be doing. So even though it's a struggle and it can be mind-boggling and it can like just sort of make you glaze over, it's worth it's worth the effort uh, to, to get there. Well, we've made analogies in the past, like you know, we're the Queen Mary cruising along at high speed in one direction. And now we're going, oh, wait, we've got to go in a completely different direction. And so we've got to just slow our minds and our conceptual thoughts and all that stuff down to a point where we can then turn the wheel and start turning the whole vessel around in its way of thinking, conceptualizing, understanding, yeah. comprehending, viewing, everything. And that it's a big takes thing. time. Yeah, it's a big thing. You know, going through the ocean real fast. You got to give yourself that time to slow it down, maneuver it, and then start going in the other direction. And so the shifts are subtle. So no wonder it's difficult. Yeah. You know? No wonder. But you just stay stay the course, so to speak. <laughs> you know, um, the shifts will be subtle. Yeah, yeah. The next thing you know, you're heading in a different direction. Right, and the momentum is on yes, your side. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you all next time. All right. Okay. The force be with y'all. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>